and start back recording when I'm doing. All right. So we, I think we stopped off. I think we stopped off here, talking about the how the Noyori ligand. Uh, here's the model that they use for ste <laughs> stereo selection was this quadrant model. So, um, and then we talked about the uh, asymmetric carbonyl uh, reduction. And that last example, how they were able to do kinetic resolution. So let's go to, they also have a actual reaction uh, where they actually use dynamic kinetic resolution. So this is in situ. So this is happening like inside the reaction vessel. There's no separate resolution that's happening. So they, they started out with these beta keto uh, esters and the, 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 the key is for this stereo center to be able to be epimerized. All that means is that you can racemize it. So if you can epimerize the stereo center right here, that's why they use the the uh, diester, uh, the malonate like this, because that makes this proton that much more acidic. So it's easier to remove it and scramble that uh, stereo center. So you got, if, if you can rapidly interconvert between two epimers, then you can see right here, the dynamic kinetic resolution is happening in real time. So this epimer right here will give you the SR isomer and 99% EO and 98% EE. And then the other epimer, the other enantiomer uh, gives you this product, 1% EO and greater than 90% EE, right? But it, it, the, in order for this to happen, the rate of interconversion has to be faster than the rate of hydrogenation to either one of these products. And that's what they, able to, they were able to set that up. That's the dynamic kinetic resolution part. Uh, and it's, it says it's dependent on the, the ligand, but the alpha position right here is substrate dependent. So um, again, with, that, with the resolution, the goal is to enrich the product mixture in one enantiomer and the other enantiomer that's not as reactive or that reacts slower, that, that particular uh, starting material won't react as fast, so you won't get as much <laughs> of the second stereo isomer, right? So that dynamic kinetic resolution, again, is done by uh, Noyori, and, and it kind of highlights something we've been talking about, and that is that you take a process and you milk it. His, the Noyori, um, the group, all they do is, or not, I'm not, I'm not minimizing what they do, but what they do is asymmetric hydrogenation. So they have milked this and, and try all these different perturbations and all these different uh, methods and taking that one method using ruthenium, a ruthenium bonding catalyst and applying it to multiple different situations and publishing it, right? That's, that's how people make careers in STEM. You find a niche, area you find an area that you know where you you develop a method and then you take that method and you apply it to a bunch of different situations you know uh and this is uh being able to um uh, hydrogenate unfunctionalized ketones right which is amazing so you just take a ketone you treat it with the ruthenium bonap and then add in uh this these amine ligands either uh, this D pin ligand or uh, day pin ligand right here. So these two ligands are additives to the ruthenium bonap catalyst. And then you treat it with <clears throat> hydrogen gas and then uh, potassium hydroxide or potassium tert-butoxide and isopropanol. And you can see here, you get really only one stereoisomer. This was published in Jackson in 98. And they gave a, a, a proposed mechanism down here where uh, the supplemental ligand or the secondary ligand is here. And you start out with this ruthenium dichloride, you add in hydrogen gas, you, it's a mono uh, hydride mechanism. Remember we, we, we said it could be a dihydride mechanism where you got two hydrogens on the metal or a monohydride mechanism where you got one. So this is 
one hydrogen on the metal, you lose HCl in the process. And then that, this is the complex that actually does your reduction. And you can see over here uh, how it works, right? You have a, uh, the NH bond is coordinated or hydrogen bonded to the oxygen on the carbonyl. And then your hydride is here. And that's what, that's how the hydrogen transfer takes place, right? And then once you do that, you end up back here at this complex with this uh, monochloral complex. And then you treat it with hydrogen gas and you get back to here, right? Because one of this H is actually coming off of the nitrogen here, which is counterintuitive. You wouldn't think that that, <laughs> that hydrogen would be acidic, <laughs> but it may be because of the nitrogen being coordinated to ruthenium right here that maybe activates that, all right? Uh, the Noyori system is also amenable to what's called transfer hydrogenation. And that is when your proton or your hydrogen doesn't come from H2. Uh, and what this does is it actually makes the process milder because you don't need high pressures like 50 bar, 20, 25 bar. You don't need to increase the temperature, nothing, right? Your, your hydrogen source is something that's not H2. Uh, and what you're in theory, what you're doing is adding H plus and H minus across the pot system. So you add the hydride to the electrophilic site and then the proton to the nucleophilic site in that pot system. So right here, you can see uh, this works for carbonyls and imines, right? Which is pretty amazing because one of the uh, more elusive products is that is to get those uh amine like the uh what's the word i'm looking for like a hydroamination type reaction which is exactly what if this is a nitrogen that's exactly what your product will resemble a hydroamination reaction that's a very difficult has been a very elusive reaction to, to do in anto selectively um so here you, you just have a chiral catalyst and a hydrogen source and you can see the I, it's the same result of a hydrogenation, but you're not using H2 uh, hydrogen gas as your hydrogen source. And you can see right here, same thing. You have an alkene with an electron withdrawing group attached, and you're able to hydrogenate in quotes that alkene, but you're not using hydrogen. You're using some other hydrogen source. And same thing here, right? You're able to again, hydrogenate or reduce the imine right here, as well as the alkene together right here. And you, you, you can do this asymmetrically by using a chiral catalyst. And down here, it has some of your hydrogen sources, right? Like isopropanol, uh, formic acid, and, and triethylamine, and then the formate anion and water. So it, it just depends on what you use. And the way, this is the kind of, the way that it works uh, is based on this model, this mirin pondor uh, pondor verily re reduction, where you use aluminum isopropoxide and isopropanol. And you can see right here, the isopropanol is your hydrogen source. And uh, the aluminum isopropoxide is using, is acting as a uh, Lewis acid to organize the transition state that's shown here, right? So the hydride is actually coming from here on the uh, isopropanol. And then of course, when you, I wish I can annotate this, but when you take these arrows and uh, this pair of electrons and move them here, you're gonna break the CO pi bond. And so that's where your alcohol is coming from here after you quench it. And then the acetone part is coming from here, right? Because you're gonna move a pair, you can move a pair of electrons from here, from the aluminum to here and get a, a pi bond, form a pi bond. So that's where the acetone is coming from. So that's transfer hydrogenation in a nutshell. And then you can, the metal catalyzed version of it, <clears throat> they are, they propose, there are two proposed mechanisms. Um, so right here, if you start with a metal dihydride and you add a carbonyl to it, right? Uh, you end up here where the metal inserts, does migratory insertion. You add a hydride to that. Uh, electrophilic carbonyl carbon, then you have another hydride left, and then that's followed by reductive elimination to give you uh, your metal back, 
and then the uh, alcohol here, now you do oxidative addition to the metal and then beta elimination to give you the aldehyde, right? So the alcohol is your source of, <clears throat> it's your source of uh, hydrogen. And then over here, <laughs> you start with uh, a, a mono, metal monohydride, you do insertion, and then you add a proton, right? And then what happens is you lose HX, but at the same time, you also uh, add in a second equivalent of your alcohol. So that gets, gets you to this uh, metal oxo complex right here, right? And then from if you do beta elimination, you're gonna get off the aldehyde and form the metal hydride. And then that's what inserts in back in the metal hydride inserts into the carbonyl. And that's how you get your alcohol here, right? You add in H plus, you lose the alcohol and then you end up with this uh, metal halide, right? So it's two different mechanisms proposed uh, for metal catalyzed transfer hydrogenation. But the point is that the hydrogen source is not H2. It's another, it comes from somewhere else. Uh, and so again, Noyori has uh, taken this reaction and optimized it using his ruthenium system Right, and, and here the, the ligands are different, like the chiral ligands are different, but he's able to optimize this, right? If you look over here uh, at 0.5 mole percent catalyst loading with the ruthenium complex and a five to two ratio of formic acid to triethylamine, that's your, that's your hydrogen source, right? Published this in 96, you can see you get one enantiomer, 90 to 99% EE, that's excellent. Uh, and then here, using isopropanol as your, as your uh, hydrogen source and KOH, 2.5 mole percent, and then 0.5 mole percent of this uh, ruthenium acetylene complex, you can, again, hydrogenate this uh, ketone, and you end up here, 72 to 98% E, with this being the major enantiomer. All right, and same thing over here. I said one, a single enantiomer, but if it, unless it's 100% EE, then it's not a single enantiomer. You just, you just don't get very much of the uh, enantiomer, right? So the, where this is on a dash. So again, this is a, a very efficient system. And here, again, with this dynamic kinetic resolution, you're actually able to take the racemic version of alcohol and uh, 0.2 more percent of this amido complex, this was published in 97 in Angamante, can be, take this racemic version and you're able to recover <laughs> the alcohol and 98% EE. So this uh, enantiomer, right? If it's racemic, you got both the R and the S mixed in, half and half. But you're able to resolve out this alcohol right here and then that's in 93 to 98% EE with 43 to 51% recovery. And you also end up with uh, the carbonyl, which is a, uh, the carbonyl, you get, you get the carbonyl as a result of beta elimination, all right? In that mechanism, in that metal catalyzed mechanism. So right here, this is the proposed uh, catalyst. This is the catalyst system. And here is your carbonyl and what they propose in the transition state that organizes everything is right here, right? So you have again that NH uh, hydrogen bonding uh, with oxygen, and then you have the hydride here uh, attacking the carbonyl carbon. And what's organizing this uh, according to the, the proposed transition state is this pi interaction right here, where the CH uh, bond here kind of interacts with the pi system on the aromatic ring here that's on the on the carbonyl. Uh, I'm not sure if you've ever heard of of this. This was a big thing when I was a graduate student and this is not necessarily this is related to uh, uh oh sorry about that. Yeah this is related to 
the, the uh, concept of pot stacking, but it's not the same thing. <clears throat> but the it's been proposed like over decades about these pot interactions that can happen and how strong they are. And it's debated about how strong they are or how weak they are. But when I was a, <laughs> a graduate student, pot stacking was, the, was a uh, plausible reasoning for a lot of different uh, observations that were being, that was seen. And it was kind of uh, frowned upon by some corners of the chemical community and other corners embraced it. Uh, and then finally there was a paper that was published, I can't remember the year, that kind of confirmed that uh, pot stacking was a real phenomenon. So uh, this CH interaction, the CH pi interaction is not a far-fetched interaction. That, they, that is a legitimate, uh, plausible occurrence to, to organize this transition or to help organize the transition state. All right, so even, even uh, with the Iridium, so now we, let's go back and talk about iridium catalyzed hydrogenation because this goes back to when we first started talking about the crab tree catalyst. Uh, we started talking about the Wilkinson catalyst, which is rhodium based, and then the Noyori catalyst, which is ruthenium based. Uh, the, the crab trees catalyst is iridium, uh, iridium based. So false has uh, multiple examples here of iridium catalyzed asymmetric hydrogenations which use the c1 symmetric ligand right so surfox and then three fox which is right here and on surfox the r2 is a proton was a hydrogen and then on three fox r2 is a methyl group um and with this with the c1 symmetric ligands which is his again his niche that's his area he he specializes in uh, C1 symmetric ligands for asymmetric reactions. So this is the synthesis of it. You start out with this uh, amino acid derivative, and in three or four steps, you're able to have you you can generate the uh, surfox or three fox ligand, and he, he's using that with a cationic iridium source, right? So iridium card. This barf uh, ligand is a boron and uh the aromatic rings have uh halogens and in this case have a fluorine on them so you can have a fluorine and then there's a, a derivative of that where the aromatic rings around the boron have uh cf3 groups on it and the the crazy thing is every time i see barf i remember uh being at carolina and the the uh, chemist who invented that counter ion I actually worked with him. I didn't work in his group, but I knew him uh, very well. Dr. Brooke, Maurice Burkhart, uh, he invented that barf ligand uh, for those cationic metal complexes. So he was like a uh, physical organic, uh, organometallic chemist. Uh, and he was, he was the nicest dude you ever wanna meet. But here with this iridium, cationic iridium barf complex, and 50 bar of hydrogen at room temperature for two hours, dichloromethane, you can see right here, right? They're able to hydrogenate these types of alkenes. These are highly substituted alkenes. Uh, and again, remember, if you remember back when we first started talking about Crabtree's catalyst, one of the advantages of the Crabtree catalyst over the Wilkinson's catalyst is that it was able to actually do hydrogenation on uh, tri and tetra substituted alkenes. So uh, you, you can look right here. You can see that this hydrogenation happens in greater than 99% EE and greater than 99% conversion. So that's excellent. So that means that when you see conversion rather than yield, what they're basing it on, basing that uh, calculation on is how much start material is left over. So that's less than 1% start material left over, which is excellent. Um, and you can see here that they have multiple, uh, false has multiple examples, the same alkene, but instead of being cis, it's trans, and uh, there's not a big drop off in the enantial selectivity. It's 92% EE, greater than 99% conversion. There's a difference in the, uh, the stereochemistry of the methyl group here. Uh, 
but there's no drop off in, in antral selectivity. You can see they're using the exact same, uh, the same ligand. All right. Uh, actually, I apologize. It's a different ligand because this is just a this is just a benzene ring, and then this is kind of like a acetylene, almost like a acetylene uh, uh, ring. So, but the the enantial selectivity does change, and the uh, conversion is greater than ninety nine percent. And then for a one one di substituted alkene like this one, um, you can see the hydrogenation here ninety four percent EE greater than 97, 99% conversion. Um, and the, the difference in this ring, the difference in the in the uh, ligand, because the metal is iridium, but the difference in the ligand is right here on phosphorus. You can see that this is, has two cyclohexyl rings on it. And then up here, you got aromatic rings. All right. Uh, but again, this is, this is phenomenal because again, one bar, <laughs> which is not super high pressure. Uh, do you do it in the methylene chloride at room temperature? So you don't have to you don't have to heat it. That means that that catalyst is really effective uh, at promoting this reaction. And then it's done in 15 minutes, uh, and you get 94% EE and greater than 99% conversion. So, which is excellent. This was published in the Council of Chemical Research, by the way, in two, 2007. Um, and then right here, you can see like the cyclic alkenes are also able to be hydrogenated. And not only is it cyclic, but it's, all, it's also heterocyclic because you have oxygen in the ring and one mole percent catalyst, which is excellent. Again, the catalyst loading, the lower you can get it, the, uh, the more um, preferable it is to have low catalyst loading as opposed to something that's above 1%. Or let me say one to 10% is good. Anything above 10%, you know, it's not that it's bad, but the lower the catalyst loading, the better. All right. And again, with the cyclic, uh, heterocyclic alkenes, 50 bar of uh, hydrogen, and then methylene chloride, room temperature, two hours, 99% EE for this enantiomer, and greater than 97% conversion. All right. And then over here, you have a you have another uh, group of reactions, but you're using a different ligand. So simple Fox, which is here, it's a uh, oxazoline ring here, and then you have a terbutyl uh, substituent on that, and then that's synthesized from uh, this amino alcohol uh, plus this uh, acid right here. All right, and then in two steps, right? And so then once you take this. And now you have this simple Fox ligand, you can see here, that's a very effective ligand for catalysis as well. So it's still with the iridium, the cationic iridium species, 50 bar of pressure, uh, dichloromethane, room temperature, two hours, 99% conversion, and then greater than 99%, and then 95%, uh, greater than 99%, sorry, and then 95% EE for this enantiomer. Same here, uh, this actually, you're actually able to uh, hydrogenate the ester in this case uh, down to the alcohol. Yeah, so you ha you're able to hydrogenate. Let me take that back. You're able to hydrogenate this species that contains an ester in greater than 99% conversion and 94% EE for the R and antimony. And then the same thing with this alcohol, right? This uh, homoallylic alcohol, 90, greater than 99% conversion, and then 97% EE. And to, to the utility of it is shown here, where you can take a, you can, you see this tricyclic backbone is is uh, similar to uh, a back the backbone that you a backbone that you may see in a natural product. And so to, to show the utility and the chemo selectivity. Right, you can have this alkene attached here, and this system at 25 bar of hydrogen pressure only hydrogenates this alkene right here. You can see that right there. It doesn't touch the one one di substituted alkene up here, and that's that's pretty phenomenal, especially with a catalyst that's as active as this one. Uh, but you only hydrogenate 
the alkene that's shown down here at 90% yield and you get one diastereomer. All right. So the C1 symmetric ligand is also amenable to heterocycles being present. <laughs> so you can see right here, uh, the thione, the uh, furan, right? All in the imidazole, all of these different functional groups are able to be hydrogenated. The alkene is hydrogenated with no diminution in the enantioselectivity. And in, in each case, 100% conversion. So with the uh, with the uh, imidazole and the furan, you can see this is a ligand right here, right? And then with the uh, thiol, the uh, thiazole, this is the ligand right here, right? 100% conversion, greater than 99% EE. And then these are some other examples using a different type of catalyst, right? Where you have kind of like this pyridinium uh, bicyclic system here that coordinates to iridium card. And this is card right here, cyclooctadiene. Uh, one of the drawbacks of the hydrogenation reactions is that sometimes card actually gets hydrogenated too, because it's a it's a diene. So um, but that that's overcome by the, the catalyst sometimes take it can also be displaced by a solvent. So that's overcome by you know you uh, using uh, solvents that either won't displace it or is overcome just by the activity of the catalyst itself. So, uh, and here with this catalyst, here are some of the substrates, all of them hydrogenated in over 90% uh, EE, each one of them, right? At one mole percent and 50 bar of hydrogen at room temperature. All right, any questions about the fault system, the Noyori system, any, any questions? so right. far all right so these are while we're talking about iridium these are some of your some of the proposed uh catalyst models for iridium you can see right here the uh dichloromethane is this is how the solvent is proposed to coordinate to the iridium in the brant model uh you have your ligand here and then uh, you have your solvent here and it's a dihydro dihydride complex. And then the false model, you have the hydrogen here and here, uh, and uh, the solvent here, right? Um, and so when you look at those two models, one of the things about the hydrogenation that's known is that the hydrogens don't, they don't want to be uh, trans to one another. They want to be cis to one another. And they don't want to be trans to the phosphorus, right? So in this complex, I know y'all are taking inorganic. So I don't know if y'all have studied the trans effect or not, but in this complex, you know, this hydrogen could be here or it could be, so that's, that would be trans to nitrogen or it could be here and be trans to phosphorus. But it prefers not to be trans to phosphorus because phosphorus is a better donor. So it prefers not, it's a hydride, so it's electron rich. So it doesn't want to be trans to phosphorus uh, because the, with the trans effect, the element that's trans, if it's electron rich, it's going to be pumping electrons into the metal and, or electron density into the metal. And that makes this site uh, more amenable to electrophilic species as opposed to nucleophilic species. And the hydride is a nucleophile. Um, so it, even here, with this Burgess and Hall model, it's actually proposed to be a trihydride complex, right? Where you have an H2 coordinated here, and then you have, uh, actually this would be considered tetra because you got two hydrogens here and you have an H2 here. Um, so these are, these are some proposed uh, structures for your, for your iridium complexes. And all, and this is a hotly debated topic. And one of the ways to test it or to determine it, you can use like, uh, in a sense, if, if you are able to isolate the complex as a crystal, then you can use something like X-ray crystallography to actually get a, a, um, a image of what that crystal looks like. 
All right, you can use that. You can, uh, there's a, that's a lot of other methods you can use. Uh, if you want, I think one of these groups, I think it was the Burgess and the Hall group, they actually use like, a, uh, they studied the hydrogenation on a deuterated species and they looked at, they used deuterium NMR like to kind of track what was happening. Uh, so these are calculations, uh, computational models for the iridium system. All right, so one of the things that's common in both mechanisms, because the, the mechanisms are proposed by two different groups, and I got the references down here, and the whole, the uh, entire uh, review is from here. It's this coordination chemistry reviews, it's from 2008. It talks about all the different models and things like that. Uh, but you see right here, uh, what's common to both pathways is this dihydrogen uh, species, right? So it's, a, it's an iridium-3 species, all right? And so the, that dihydride is common to both. And you, you can see in both mechanisms, the uh, coordination and removal of a solvent. It can be, again, dichloromethane, or whatever your solvent is. And again, the structure of that complex is dictated by that trans effect. So where your hydrides are is gonna be dictated by uh, what the ligand is composed of, right? So here, if Y is a phosphorus, you can see again, the this hydride, it could be here where the solvent is, <laughs> but it prefers to be trans to nitrogen and not to the phosphorus uh, atom in that ligand. And that's due to the trans effect. And it's also dictated by sterics. And that's where your chiral ligands come into play, right? Depending on how those chiral ligands are arranged around the metal, that's also going to dictate the structure. Uh, and so with this mechanism, you can see if we go, if we start here with hydrogen, and this is the common uh, complex. So we're starting with the iridium three, uh, and we add in a hydride. Oh, I'm sorry, adding hydrogen gas and the al and an alkene, right? And kick off the two solvent molecules. You can see that the hydride or hydrogen gas is coordinated here, and then your alkene is coordinated here where your solvent molecules were, right? Then you go through again that migratory insertion, and then followed by you have reductive elimination, but then you end up with this complex right here, and that type of uh, interaction is like because i was when i was looking at this preparing i was trying to figure out how this complex was still uh intact and showing the hot the uh, hydrogens coordinating with the metal but one of the things that you can have uh is called is what's called a gostic interaction uh and that's where a hydrogen on a chain can actually kind of wrap around or fold, the, the chain can fold around and the hydrogen can actually coordinate with the metal uh, the, with, through like a sigma donation, right? So uh, with that, you if you notice right here, when you add the two solvent molecules in, it pops right off and it gets you back to the iridium three complex. And on the other side is more traditional, right? You start here, you add in your alkene, you kick off a solvent molecule and you go from, uh, you go here to this uh, cationic complex, then you add in solvent, which gives you, which takes you to uh, back to iridium three. And then you can, you just do your insertion followed by reductive elimination to give you your uh, hydrogenated species. And now you're back here at iridium one. And then that brings you, if you add in H2, it brings you back here to iridium three. So these are proposed, they're debated. Uh, there's evidence for on both sides for one of these being uh, the dominant pathway, depending on what the ligands are. And you can uh, for for the references here. Uh, this is this was published in so on the left side. These are this method is um, favored by or the, actually was developed by Faults and then uh, Dedeker and Chen, right? So this is the, the iridium one to iridium three uh, cycle. And then for the iridium three to five cycle, that was developed by Brent and Hedberg uh, and favored by them. So, and this was, a, again, these, these are computational models for what this 
uh, mechanism looks like. All right. So one, one other asymmetric hydrogenation strategy I want to talk about is this diborane strategy. Right. This was developed by uh, Morgan, Dr. Morgan, who was my PhD advisor, and then uh, another lab mate of mine, Jeremy Morgan. Uh, so if you take the uh, like a diborane, uh, uh, this is a pentacol ligand on, on uh, boron. So you take this dipentacol borane and treat it with hydrogen gas, room temperature, 20 bar of a hydrogen uh, with this rhodium norbronodiene, cationic rhodium, and then wall phos, which is this ligand right here. <coughs> um, you can see right here, there's a couple of perturbations of wall phos where the R on a phosphorus group changes, right? So it's either uh, phenyl, like two aromatic rings or two cyclohexane rings. And you've seen that already, even with the, uh, with the false catalyst, right? So wall phos is this, like it has this ferris, iron ferrocenal uh, complex out here. But what binds to the ligand, to the rhodium, is actually the phosphorus groups right here. They chelate to the metal, and that's where your chirality comes from. Um, and you can see right here with just a simple, with the R, when R is an aromatic ring, right, with uh, the wall phos with R equals, uh, where R is a uh, phenyl group, you can see in toluene, 90% yield, 93% EE. And I think the maximum enantial selectivity for this system was 93%, right? And you can see it right here, even for um, aliphatic systems where this is a terp-butyl, you get 89% yield and 93% EE, right? And then for this uh, substituted aromatic system, 92% yield, 86% EE and toluene. Uh, and you can also see right here that there's some solvent effect, right? Because in, in uh, when you compare like with, with this aliphatic system where this is a pentyl, just a, a chain, five carbon chain, uh, there's with toluene, you have 86% yield and 77% EE. But when you do it in dichlor one, two dichloroethane, which is a different solvent and it's non-aromatic, uh, you can see that the yield is about the same, 81%. And it's not a big difference, but the enantial selectivity goes up from 77 to 85, and that is a big difference. Uh, same thing here. In dichloroethane, the enantial selectivity is around 89%. And then when you take the terbutyl version of this in dichloroethane with O8, which is cyclo, where the R groups are cyclohexyl groups on the phosphorus, you get 92% EE and 89% yield. So as a as a an extension of this chemistry, and then let me back up. Once you get the hydrogenated version of this, uh, so where that where the pi bond is hydrogenated, you can actually convert those borons uh, with hydro, uh, hydrogen peroxide and sodium hydroxide. You can actually convert them into alcohols. So this is a very like a, a very neat way to generate chiral diols, right? Uh, where you you set a chiral center through the hydrogenation, and then through the um, through just uh, oxidation using hydrogen peroxide and sodium hydroxide, you're able to get out the diol. And to prove as a, like a proof of concept and an application of the concept, uh, this method was applied to alkynes, right? So first you had to make the diborane from here, and then you treat it with a wall phos, and then after that. Uh, you actually uh, oxidize that, those borons up to the alcohols using hydrogen peroxide and sodium hydroxide. And you can see right here, the catalyst loading, uh, there's a, it's a 5% of your cationic rhodium and then 7% of your ligand. Um, and then here, they also applied it to like a homologation strategy. So you make the, you hydrogenate this down and then, <clears throat> Uh, you actually can extend the, the uh, chain by one carbon, right? So you can see right here, you end up adding a carbon. And then here, you also end up adding a carbon. And in doing and so you add, you extend, and then you oxidize. And in doing so, you're able to, again, get this homologation product, 
which is important because again the when you have a method and you develop a method you're always thinking long range as far as like how what you're going to apply that method to right so you get this in 76 percent yield and 92 percent ee so for the asymmetric hydrogenations we talked about the, the origins with the wilkinson's catalyst and the crabtree catalyst and then we talked about the innovation with the new yori catalyst and being able to not just hydrogenate alkenes but also carbonyls and do it asymmetrically do it using a kinetic resolution and we talked about the iridium catalyst like with faults uh and then also adding in this uh strategy with where you can take a diborane and hydrogenate it asymmetrically and then get out uh, a chirodial so with that being said that's the that's this is the last uh part of, of the discussion for asymmetric hydrogenation so on monday we'll start uh another topic i think we're going to do um because we've already done uh organometallics and organo i think we're going to do we're going to go back backwards and do uh so we talked about clazin and ireland clazin and cope rivers so we talked about the sigma tropic rearrangements already i think we're going to do um deals all the chemistry so talk about the deals all the reaction as well as the asymmetric version of that uh deals alder and I really think that's going to be our last set of lectures. And then uh, I'll give, I'm, I'm going to give you a topic based on something that we've already talked about. Uh, and then we're going to, you'll, you'll be able to put a presentation together based on that. And I'll give you, um, I'll give you the, 